So maybe a year ago, the Property Owners Association updated the lookout that we're all familiar with, and I think they did a pretty good job. Um, they paved the area, so it's much better than the previous gravel lot there, just above Brenda Story's house. They added some grass and some seasonal plantings to give it some color and some other texture besides the stone. They did retain the, the stone benches, added the little uh, stone surround, and, and the split rail fence is nice and handsome too. I just love what they've done uh, with the lookout right there. Um, there's one other thing um, that visitors get which is quite helpful, and that's this uh, right here. The little lookout locator. Um, if you're not familiar with the area and you stop by, we took that picture this morning, um, in fact. Um, and of course, if you go up there, it kind of shows you Spartanburg and Greer and Greenville and Pickens County way over there on the right. And um, kind of an interesting little helpful uh, thing. And in fact, um, I try to remind my family on occasion how fortunate we are to drive by that lookout and to do so so frequently. You see, I, I, I tell the boys that many of their friends, many of their classmates um, will not likely ever get to come up on this mountain and have that view. And so they're blessed to be able to see that view and to appreciate that. Now, their friends certainly may travel to, to uh, Pigeon Forge or uh, some other mountainous area and have a mountain view, but they won't likely get to see the mountain for which their school is named after, Mountain View Elementary or Blue Ridge. And, and yet here we are every week and multiple times during the week, we get to, to see that it's really special. Another a neat experience at the lookout, and many of you know this, um, you see it even from your homes, is watching the afternoon thunderstorms come through. Because on occasion, uh, you're not receiving a thunderstorm, but you can see them wherever they are out there. And uh, that's just kind of a neat experience uh, to be able to look out from that uh, place and see the thunderstorms as they, as they come through. There's one more view from the lookout that many folks don't get to see, and that is this one here. Now that's pretty cool. Uh, there are some mornings where the fog... This particularly happens in the fall and the winter where the fog kind of rolls down the mountain and it is foggy in the flatlands where I live, but on my way up the mountain, you just burst forth into this glorious picture um, and you just look like you're in an airplane and that you could just kind of walk on the, the clouds, walk on the fog. And I just think that is so cool. In fact, that morning I had taken a picture from our house because it was thick as soup. And of course, you know what that's like up here too, because you live in the clouds sometimes, but it was thick. And I don't know what led me to take a picture of it that morning, but it was just thick. And then on my way up, you know, this happened. And it was, it was a reminder to me in that moment um, of how God can turn our gray, foggy, can't see anything in front of me life into clear, blue, I can see for miles kind of life. And he did that within a few moments, just to travel from my house to the mountain, 20 minutes. And what a drastic difference it is. So what a neat thing. God can lift us above all of that to a life of hope and clarity and vitality. Well, this morning, as we continue our summer sermon series, Mountains of Faith, I want to take you to another lookout. It's a mountain called Nebo, so if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, or there's one in the pew there with you, or you can find, hopefully, an app on your phones, I'd like to invite you to turn with me to the passage you heard Bob and Audrey read earlier, Deuteronomy chapter 32 and chapter 34. Again, another book of the Bible that we don't uh, turn to that frequently. We've been, for the past couple of weeks, in the book of Genesis, beginning with Mount Ararat. And then going to Mount Moriah, where God encounters Abraham. And then last week with Mount Sinai. Do any of you remember the other name of Sinai? I told you there was two names of Sinai last week. Mount Horeb. Mount Horeb and Sinai. So today we turn to Deuteronomy 32. And as you're finding your place there, let me just remind us 
of what we have discovered last week when we visited Mount Sinai. We were reminded of God's call upon the life of Moses. And that call occurred in the burning bush, and that was on Mount Horeb. And you might recall at the end of that conversation at the burning bush, God said, when the Israelites come out of Egypt, you will worship me on this mountain. And the next time we saw them at the mountain was in the giving of the Ten Commandments, but the mountain's name was Sinai at that moment. And of course, he called the Israelites there to live holy lives dedicated and set apart for his glory. And ultimately, we were reminded that God calls us. He calls us personally. He calls us by name and asks us that we too live for him and serve him. And today's mountain finds its place at the end of Moses' life. So we've essentially kind of, in three, two weeks, kind of covered Moses' life from beginning call to the people of Israel and now to the end of his life. And the verses, these first verses describe how God told Moses about his death and then demonstrate God's grace in allowing Moses a view of the promised land. If you'll permit me, I'm going to reread these verses for us that Bob and Audrey read earlier. That very day the Lord spoke to Moses. This is Deuteronomy 32, verse 48. That very day the Lord spoke to Moses, Go up to this mountain of the Abarim, it's a mountain range, by the way, the Abarim range. Mount Nebo, which is in the land of Moab, opposite Jericho, and view the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to the people of Israel for a possession, and die on the mountain which you go up, and be gathered to your people as Aaron your brother died in Mount Hor and was gathered to his people, because you broke faith with me in the midst of the people of Israel at the waters of Mirabah Kadesh, the wilderness of Zan, and because you did not treat me as holy in the midst of the people of Israel, for you shall see the land before you, but you shall not go there into the land that I am giving to the people of Israel. And then if you flip on over to 34, what Moses saw when he did go up on Mount Nebo. So then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo to the top of Pisgah. Let me just pause right there and the best way I can figure this in looking at Deuteronomy 32 and Deuteronomy 34 is the Abarim is the range, kind of like the Blue Ridge Mountains. It's kind of a range. But then you have Mount Nebo, which is a mountain within the range, kind of like we have Glassy Mountain within the Blue Ridge Range. And then as best I can figure when you run across that phrase to the top of Pisgah, Pisgah is the peak on Mount Nebo. So you've got Mount Nebo that's within a range, but then you've got Pisgah, which is the peak of Mount Nebo. That's, as best I can figure, all of these names coming together, which is opposite Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land, Gilead as far as Dan, all of Naphtali, the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the western sea, the Negev and the plain that is, the valley of Jericho city of palm trees, as far as Zoar. And the Lord said to Moses, This is the land of which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to your offspring. Moses, I've let you see this with your eyes. But you shall not go over there. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab according to the word of the Lord, and he buried him in the valley in the land of Moab opposite Beth Baor. But no one knows the place of his burial to this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died, and yet his eyes were undimmed and his vigor unabated. And the people of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab for 30 days. And then the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. And Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands on him. And so the people of Israel obeyed obeyed him and did all as the Lord had commanded Moses. And there has not arisen a prophet since in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. None like him, for all the signs and the wonders that the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his servants, and to all his land, and for all the mighty power and all the great deeds of terror that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. So you remember the landmark locator that I showed you just a moment ago from our lookout here on Glassy. Well, if you climb Mount Nebo today, this is what you'll see. Another land locator. Uh, It uh, describes various cities and destinations 
within the promised land, uh, starting on my left, your right, is Hebron. And then, uh, let's see, you've got uh, the Dead Sea and the Herodium, and then Bethlehem, Qumran, uh, Jerusalem, the Mount of Olives is on there, Ramallah, Jericho, Nablus, and Lake Tiberias uh, are also listed there. So just a connection, kind of, of sorts, between our mountain and that mountain, a, a locator, and as you climb to view um, the promised land, uh, that's what you, you have there, and it gives references uh, to the distance from there. We're told that Moses wasn't allowed to enter the promised land because of his disobedience to God at Meribah Kadesh. And so just uh, as a reminder, because some of you are probably saying, I don't, even, I don't even remember that. I don't even, I know at, probably at some stage I had read that or heard it in Sunday school. So just as a reminder, back in Numbers chapter 20, and some of you are thinking, I don't ever read Numbers. Um, so back in Numbers 20, the Israelites were without water. And so they came to Moses and they came to Aaron, Moses' brother, and they came complaining and asking that, that Moses would go to the Lord and, and get an answer. So Moses and Aaron do, in fact, go to the Lord, and they go into the tent of meeting, and, and God descends there upon the, the tent of meeting. And Moses tells, them, tells God about the situation. And God says to Moses, here's what I want you to do, Moses. I want you to go out and I want you to speak to the rock. When you do that, water's going to gush forth from the rock. But when Moses and Aaron left the tent and they go before the Israelites, listen to what happened. This is Numbers chapter 20. So Moses did as he was told. He took the staff from the place where it was kept before the Lord. And then he and Aaron summoned the people to come and gather at the rock. Listen, you rebels, must we bring you water from this rock? And then Moses raised his hand and struck the rock twice with the staff. And water gushed out. And so the entire community and their livestock drank their fill. There's a couple of things that happened here. The first mistake that Moses and Aaron made is that they took credit for what God was going to do. Did you hear that? Must we bring water out for you? And the we is not me and God. The we is me and Aaron. Aaron and I. Better language. They took credit for what God was going to do. The second mistake is that Moses hits the rock. God told him, speak to the rock. And you say, well, gee, you know, a little minor alter, you know, alteration of the plan. What's the big deal? Well, here's the big deal. In his anger and in his frustration, Moses didn't trust God. He didn't trust God to do what God was said he would do, despite the fact that he had seen God respond in all sorts of ways prior to this. He allowed one moment of sin and not listen to what God had said. And so he strikes the rock instead of speaking to it. The third error was that they did this in front of the community. It wasn't done in the pastor's study. It wasn't done in the living room. It was done in public. And it was done in front of the people. And even though the Israelites had done much worse, Moses and Aaron were leaders and God's standards for them as the leaders of his people was a bit higher than it was for the rest of the Israelites. So the first thing I want us to understand this morning as we consider this, because it just seems so harsh to you and me, knowing Moses and knowing the call and knowing what he did and how he led the people and how he was used by God, it just seems so harsh to us that God would say, Moses, I'm not letting you over there because you messed up right here. Come on, God. Where's the grace? Where's the mercy? That's, that's, that's what we know you for. This seems a bit severe. The first thing I want us to understand is, is as much as it goes against our human sensibilities, the fact that Moses doesn't get to enter the promised land isn't a matter of God not being fair. Rather, it's another opportunity for him to show grace and demonstrate faithfulness to fulfill his oath to Abraham. I want you to think about it. Anytime you and I sin, it's going to be harsh. Think about this. Anytime you and I sin, God is within his right to take us out. Anytime that we look him in the eyes and go our own way, God is within his right as our creator to take us out at that moment. And God could have done that with Moses and Aaron, but he said, you know what? I'm going to let you see into the promised land nonetheless. I'm going to be gracious to you. I'm going to let you see the fulfillment of all that you've done. 
And so the first thing I want us to see this morning is the vision of Moses. Stretching out before Moses due north is Gilead and Dan, then swinging westward. He sees Naphtali, and to the south is Ephraim and Manasseh and Judah, and then the Mediterranean all the way to the west. You can't literally see that far from Nebo, but nonetheless, that's what he was looking at. All of that culminating at the valley of Jericho. The vision that Moses received reaffirmed that he was a part of something bigger than himself. He led the people of Israel through the wilderness so that others could experience a blessing. Although he knows that he won't enter the promised land himself, nevertheless, Moses continues to preach. Moses continues to encourage them to live according to God's word. He teaches them to obey God's commands. He knew he wouldn't get to go into the land himself, but he, he wanted to continue the mission. You see, Moses teaches us that ministry is something that we give to others. Ministry is bigger than our own needs. It's bigger than our own blessings. When Moses stood on Mount Pisgah there on top of Mount Nebo looking at the promised land, he saw how his effort would bear fruit. Folks, we never know how God will use our ministry. Peter Story, a former Methodist bishop in South Africa, uh, tells the ministry of Trevor, Trevor Huddleston. Trevor Huddleston was an Anglican priest in the 1950s in South Africa. And in the midst of apartheid, Huddleston worked faithfully in a black township named Sophia Town. When the military trucks came to uproot the people living in that township and destroy their homes, he tried to stop them, and he was rebuked by his bishop and sent back to England. And Huddleston had visited regularly with an altar boy um, who had tuberculosis in South Africa. And even though he had failed to stop the outrage of the people who were being dispersed from their homes, his ministry had a lasting effect, more so than he could have ever imagined. For you see, the altar boy who he had been visiting with tuberculosis was none other than Desmond Tutu. And so Story writes that at the end of apartheid, only then could the full impact of Trevor Huddleston's ministry be appreciated. And Story reflects upon this and says that just after the demise of apartheid, Trevor Huddleston's impact on South Africa through Desmond Tutu is immeasurable. There's a direct line between his witness in Sophia Town and this moment of peace. Folks, how wonderful would it be if you and I could climb a metaphorical mountain to see all the lives that are impacted by this church, who are touched through the coming years. How many children at Tomasi will have safe homes? How many hurting people will be healed through the medical work of Garen and Sharon and the friends of the children of Haiti? How many broken hearts will be comforted by the fellowship of this church? How many Filipinos and Taiwanese and Latinos will make a commitment to Jesus Christ through the evangelism of the Tebos and Nancy Lee and the Millsaps? Because we support them financially. We support them in our prayers. How many barriers of injustice will come down because of the ministries of this church? Sometimes we could use a trip to the top of a metaphorical mountain, even if only for a vision into the promised land. If we could get a panoramic view of all that our ministry could accomplish, that might keep us going. It might keep us going when committee meetings get long and boring and we get tired. A view from Mount Nebo, a view from Glassy Mountain of the Promise might keep us going when the money gets tight or when the disagreements heat up. A view from the mountaintop might keep us going through the discouragement and the fatigue and the disappointment of ministry. We may not physically climb Mount Nebo to the top of Pisgah to see all that this church can and will accomplish. But folks, we can trust that God, with our time and with our work and with our effort and our money and our sweat and even our pain, we can trust that God will use it and work through us. The second thing I want us to see is the death of Moses. And see, here's the kicker. The text clearly says... That although Moses was 120 years old, his eyes were not bad. He was not in bad health. His eyes were not bad. He still had vigor. He still had strength. But once again, like it or not, not being allowed into the promised land, it might sound a bit frank, but his work on behalf of God was complete. The men's 
Bible study on Tuesday mornings has been studying the book of Acts for a little over a year now. We're getting close to the end. Yes, I said a year, ladies. Uh, we spent quite a bit of time digging through those verses and those books, and I'm reminded every Tuesday that we get together, one of the men or several of them will say, we're still in the book of Acts. The Lord's going to come back before we finish the book of Acts. All these kind of comments. But for the past several weeks, we've been constantly reminded by the text that God confirmed to Paul that he would testify in front of kings and those in authority, and that he would do so even in Rome. And here's what I want us to remember, and this is what we've been seeing in our men's Bible study, is that all through these last several chapters, from the time that Paul was arrested, he's gone through trials, he's gone through attempted murders and killings, he was shipwrecked. He was bitten by a venomous snake. All sorts of things entering into the life of Paul. And yet he had been told, you're going to get there. So the point is, with all of this, at every turn he had to be reminded that he was not going to die until God was finished with him. Moses learned as far back as chapter 3 of Deuteronomy that he wasn't going to get into the promised land and that ultimately he was going to die on Mount Nebo. It is far better for you and me to recognize that all of life is sacred. Now, the now is the defining moment in every life. James chapter 4 says, Listen, you who say today or tomorrow that we will go and do this or that in some city and spend a year there or carry on business and make money. Why? You don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. What's your life? Your life is but a mist. It appears and then it's gone. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord's will, then we will live and do this or that. Green Bay Packers coach Vince Lombardi used to prepare his players for a game by telling them this, that every play is the football game. One missed tackle, one missed block, one drop pass. You'd never know how things might have turned out differently. You have to give every effort on every play as though that one play will make all the difference. Folks, we cannot regain tomorrow. We have to face each spiritual choice with alertness and vigor, for in that choice may be our lives. We need to rest in the knowledge that as long as you are living, God is not done with you. As long as you are drawing breath, God is not done with you. He has a purpose for your life. And that leads to the last point that I'll make this morning. And that is the testimony of Moses. Part of finishing the work that Moses had to do was providing for Israel's continuation. And that work was now transferred to the capable hands of Joshua, who according to Deuteronomy was filled with the spirit of wisdom because he had been ordained at the hands of of Moses. Now Joshua didn't receive any new statutes, he didn't receive any new ordinances, but he urged Israel to do what the Lord had commanded. And the failure of Moses to enter the land only cast a very small shadow upon an otherwise unique life. The author of these final words in this book says, and there has not arisen a prophet since in Israel like that of Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Folks, Moses left a legacy that far outreached his own life. And my question to you this morning is, what is yours? What's your legacy? What's your epitaph? What's that lasting story that people will remember about you? What's the one word that will come to people's minds when your name is mentioned and you're no longer on earth? What's your epitaph going to be? I'll close with this story. John Harper was a Scottish Baptist pastor. He died in the Titanic disaster. And Harper was born in the village of Houston, Renfrewshire, Scotland in 1872. He embraced the faith of his parents at the age of 14 and he began preaching at the age of 18. He supported himself in his early adulthood by doing manual labor in a mill until a Baptist pastor by the name of E.A. Carter who was head of the Baptist Pioneer Mission in London, heard about his preaching and decided to place him in ministry in Govan, Scotland. And so in 1897, he became the first pastor of Paisley Road Baptist Church in Glasgow, Scotland. And under his care, that church grew from 25 members to over 500. That was in 1897. That's a lot of people for that day and that time. 
And ultimately they moved to a new location on Plantation Street. At the time of the Titanic disaster, Harper was 39 years old. He was a widower with a six-year-old daughter, a girl by the name of Annie Jessie that they called Nana, a pastor of Woolworth Road Baptist Church in London. And he was traveling with his daughter and his sister Jessie to Chicago to preach for several weeks at the Moody Church where he had been a guest minister the previous fall when, of course, the ship hit the iceberg on April 14th. His daughter and sister were put on a lifeboat and survived, but Harper stayed behind and jumped or fell into the water as the boat was going down. And he began swimming from one passenger to another, appealing to individuals to trust Christ. And he asked one young man who was sitting on a piece of floating debris, Are you saved? And the man said, No. And Harper shouted the words of Acts 16, 31, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. And the man didn't answer him, and a moment later, John Harper, with his teeth chattering in the frigid cold, moved away to talk to another person. Later, the current brought the two men back together, and again, Harper asked, Are you saved? And once again, the man answered negatively. And with his last breath, Harper once again urged, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Nobody saw Harper after that. But at a Titanic survivors meeting in Canada some years later, this man gave his testimony recounting how John Harper had led him to Jesus. And he said, I was John Harper's last convert. Later, that account and many other stories of the lives of those touched by the words of John Harper in the frigid waters of the North Atlantic were put into a book the Titanic's last hero. Folks, many of us are merely treading water, waiting for an inevitable end. I'm retired. My health's going downhill. As long as you and I are drawing breath, God is not done with us. What legacy are you leaving? Who are you pointing people to with your last frigid breath? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. God wants us to be remembered for the way we made him known. Moses' epitaph wasn't written on stone, but it was written on the pages of Scripture and in loving memory of believing people everywhere. And when you and I are gone, what testimony will we leave behind? Let's pray.